And Father, I pray that I'll be a good sower going forth to sow good seed that'll fall upon good soil that'll produce good fruit, fruit that'll remain. So Father, I ask you to bless us now and let this speak to our hearts today so that we can all repent and do what you've called us to do. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Give him a shout and a hand clap. Amen. 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 Be seated. Be seated. We're in our series, and the series is called Don't Be Like. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about people that we should be like, but it also talks a lot about people that we shouldn't be like. And so we're do doing a series on Don't Be Like. So today we want to talk about Don't Be Like Saul. Who is Saul? Saul, the Bible tells us there's two people in the book of, in the Bible that, that, that are named Saul. One is the New Testament, one is the Old Testament. The one in the New Testament changed his name from Saul to Paul, and he became the Apostle Paul. Uh, we want to be like that. The other one in the Old Testament his name was Saul. He's the first king of Israel, and we don't want to be like that. So it's him that we'll be speaking of. So what I want to do first is just read you some snippets, some pieces, some scriptures through his life that will kind of give us some insight as to this guy, Saul. We'll all get on the same page, and we'll see. And I want you to, what I want you to look for is the depreciation of his life, how he began well and ended poorly. So let's look at this as we read. In 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 2, it says, He had a son named Saul. This is Kish, Saul's father. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Uh, Saul was a charismatic person. He was a good person. And as we, or as we were introduced to, to him in the scriptures, he's a, he's a well-mannered person. He's a, he's a meek and a humble person. And this is the person that we meet. Impressive. He impressed people. He impressed the Lord. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 47, it said, After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, uh, the kings of Zobah. And the Philistines. Now, in our own lives, what this simply means, and I'll just leave the scripture up, I'll be right back. But, but what that means, means in our own life is, is that there are things in our lives, when, in our soul dimension, when we come into the kingdom of God, how many know we still have some battles to fight, right? And what, and what God wants us to do is run those things out. So, as we're applying this to our life, the Saul drives those things out initially. It, it, it starts off really well, and it really wants those things out of our lives. And so that's what we've all done. We've kind of come into this complex and, 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 and situation where we, we start well. Let me go on now. Um, Saul was chosen of God and powerful, and, and uh, let me read the rest of the Scripture. Whenever he turned, he inflicted prom, uh, punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites delivering Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. See, those things that are in us plunder us. And we drive them out, then they'll stop plundering. And that's, that's the principle that we can learn from that. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 and 14, it says, You acted foolishly. Now notice that something's happened. Saul, though chosen of God, though appointed of God, doing very well, a very powerful person in the kingdom of God, now Samuel, the prophet, says, You acted foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people. Because of you, because you have not kept the Lord's command. So Saul began now to disobey. And we see things beginning to change, and his disobedience now leads him down a road of degeneration. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10 through 11, it says, I am grieved, this is the Lord speaking, I am grieved that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me, number one, and number two, has not carried out my instructions. Saul's life began to grieve the Lord. And then look at this one in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the devil. What, what? Did I do something? An evil spirit from the devil. Is that what it says? Is that what it means? An evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul, close to the end of his days, in fact, he only had one day left, finds himself in a witch's house. A place trying to conjure up 
a dead man's ghost, a dead man's spirit, Samuel. And here's what Samuel, who did show up, said to Saul. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? Now, think where he was and now where he is. Impressive even to the Lord. And now the Lord's turned away from you and become your enemy. The Lord has done it. Now, notice he says that once there. He, the Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands. Not the devil. Who? The Lord. And given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord. Second time he says it. Or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has. He's the third time he says the Lord has done it. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. And look at this. And tomorrow you and your children will be dead like I am. What happened? How did he start so well and end so poorly? I, I want a life that doesn't end poorly. I want a life that does well while I'm alive and starts out well but ends better. I want a life that increases and not decreases. I don't want to come to the end of my days and have grieved the Lord and have been tormented by an evil spirit and have done something that now reflects to my children and my grandchildren. I want to end well. Is it possible that this can happen? Is it possible that a person can experience the Spirit of the Lord moving great power and great victory in a life that's going on and doing well only for that Spirit to leave that person and a tormenting Spirit come upon that person and for that person to become an enemy of the Lord? Is that possible? Some of you are going to have to deal with some things today. I ask you not to go with the teachings and doctrines of men, but by the Word of God. And see what the Lord says to you through His Word today. Saul, at his beginning, began well, but he didn't end well, and we don't want to be like Saul. So let's look at it just a little bit. Let's look at his life at the beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 6 through 7. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. This is Samuel telling Saul what's going to happen in his life. He's going to come upon you in power. Saul, you're going to have a powerful life. You're going to have a great life. He's going to come upon you in power, and you will prophesy. You're going to be a man of God. You're going to do great things. You're going to prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. You're going to have this born-again kind of a situation. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do. Once, once this happens to you, once the Spirit of God comes on you, and man, you're going to be powerful, I want you to, to go for it. Go for it. Do great things for the Lord, for God is with you. That's how he began. And Saul experienced a wonderful life. He was transformed. The Bible says he got a new heart. The Bible says how, how powerful he was and what great things he did. He had great victories. But then something happened. Does that ever happen to you? Life's going along pretty well, you know. Looks like it's up and up and up. And man, you know, got money and healthy and things are going wonderful. And, and then something happens. What happened? Well, what happened is probably the same thing that happened to Saul. What happened in Saul's life is he was about doing the Lord's will. He was doing what the Lord had called him and purposed him and birthed him to do. He was winning wars and fighting battles. And then he runs into a conflict that he shouldn't have even been fighting. But he runs into a conflict. And what the conflict was is he was battling the Philistines and the Philistines had him outnumbered and his, his army got frightened and, and ran. He shouldn't have even been fighting this fight. He was supposed to be waiting on the Lord, waiting on Samuel to get there. Anyway, he's fighting, and that's what happens in our lives. You know, we're going along pretty well, and all of a sudden, we hit a conflict. <laughs> and uh, we start doing what, Sam, what Saul did, and that's take things into our own hands. 
rather than doing what the Lord told us to do. See, what had happened, I'm going to read you the scripture in just a second, but what had happened is, is Samuel had told Saul, you don't do anything, you wait until I get there. When I get there, I'm going to tell you what to do. Instead of that, Saul went ahead and got in this fight, got in this battle, and here we are. Let me read you the, the verse in... Uh, 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 do, 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 do. Okay, am I ahead of myself? I am ahead of myself. Let me read you this verse. See if you can find me. In, uh, in, in 1 Samuel 10, 8, it says, But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. You must wait. And he didn't wait. And he took things into his own hand. Now, what I want us to see here is, is that we do what Saul did in our lives. We become impatient. And here's what, here's what happened. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 9, it says, So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. And here's what Samuel said, what have you done? Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, and he went on with his excuses. What have you done? What had he done? What, what, what had he done that was so wrong? What had he done? Because whatever that he'd done changed his life so drastically that it took him from being uh, impressive down to where he's at a witch's house trying to conjure up Samuel. What had he done? What he done is what we do. We get impatient with God. We get in our conflicts and we cry out to God to come and help us and deliver us from our conflict. And God doesn't show up when we think he should show up. And so we start taking things into our own hand. Let me show you, let me show you what, what Samuel said to him. It's 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13 through 14. He says, you acted foolishly. Would you say that back to me? You acted foolishly foolishly has that ever happened to you <laughs> have you ever acted foolishly you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you now look at this if you had he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time but now yo know, wouldn't it be great just leave that up there wouldn't it be great if we could see five years or ten years down the road, what our obedience today accomplished. Wouldn't it be great? Would, it would be easy to obey then, wouldn't it? Man, if, oh, if I do this, I get that. And we, if we could just know, well, let me tell you, you can know. You, you'll get what, what Saul would have gotten, which was his kingdom, which was the abundant life which was righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, which was, is everything that you've ever wanted. He says, if you would have just done what I asked you to do, I would have established it for you forever. But now, but now, he says, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people. Because you, second time he says it in this, in this section, because you have not kept the Lord's command. As I was studying Saul, I saw that he had a bunch of problems. Now, I know none of us here have a bunch of problems, but, but Saul had a bunch of problems. When I looked at Jezebel and when I looked at, at Absalom, you know, in our study, it was a little bit different. Absalom had this one major problem, and it was the root of bitterness against Amnon, his brother, and David, his dad, and that took him to his demise. When I looked at Jezebel, Jezebel had this one major problem where she urged people to do evil. But when I look at Saul, there's a bunch of things. And I'm going to show you some of them. But it was a bunch of things in him. And what I'm trying to relate to you today is maybe you didn't hook up with Absalom. Maybe you couldn't relate to him. Or maybe you couldn't hook up with Jezebel. And maybe you couldn't relate to her in, in, in the don't be likes. But I'm telling you, i got something here today that's going to get every one of us. All of us have some Saul in us. All of us have the potential. And we start out so well, but we end sometimes so poorly. Saul's life was a progression and an accumulation of problems not dealt with. And those accumulation and him not dealing with those problems took him to his demise. 
I want to show you some of these things that I see right here in this section that I think will help us and give us some insights into our own lives. It said there, uh, you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Gave you. Not gave somebody else. Gave you. Now, he's not talking here about the Ten Commandments. I want to stop just a second here and ask you, what has God gave you to do? He's, he's given us all something to do. It's not the Ten Commandments, that's universal, but we're talking here about gave you to do. Something specific. Because if you're not keeping it, you're heading down the road of Saul. He says, he says you haven't kept what the Lord your God gave you. I've heard this talked about this command that he messed up with was that he had offered a sacrifice and he wasn't a priest or a prophet. And so his offering a sacrifice made the Lord angry. That was the command he didn't keep. But that's not true because both David and Solomon were kings and not priests. And they offered sacrifices and they pleased the Lord, correct? So that's not it. It was something specific. It was something that, that, that Saul did specifically. And he didn't wait. Let me read you the scripture now. In case it wasn't up there just a second ago in 1 Samuel 10, 8, but you must wait. What part of must wait do we not understand? You must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you, are do, what you, what you must do. Now, now what, realize, remember what he was doing. He was fighting the Philistines. He shouldn't have been fighting. He should have been waiting. Instead, he was fighting. And then he takes the, the sacrifices and he offers them, offers them himself. He's impatient. Now, here's what, I, if you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. Saul's demise began with impatience. Saul's entire life changed because of impatience. Saul terminated his future generations because of his impatience. We need to understand that what we do in life truly affects our children. And if we can't control our patience, we got a problem. Impatience can cost you everything. Now, when I saw this, my knee-jerk reaction was, oh, me, because I am a very impatient man. I have done some dumb things because of my impatience. And my impatience has cost me a lot. Now, I know nobody here. Well, let me just ask. Uh, how many has ever gotten a speeding ticket? Why did you get a speeding ticket? Come, come on. It's simple. Did it cost you? Impatience sometimes is small, and it costs a little. Sometimes it's big and it costs a lot, but impatience always costs. I was coming back from Florida. Jude and I were talking about this last night. And I was coming back from Florida a couple of years ago in my diesel, and uh, I got to get there. I got to cut grass. I got to pay bills. I got to make deposits. I got to get there. <laughs> and so I kept seeing these signs along the highway that says diesel had a good price, you know. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here and get my diesel and take off again. I pull in, and I'm used to pulling up diesel, green handle, right? Pull up, green handle, brrr, car it in, pump in, fill it up, pump out, close it, car it out, gone. Hit back on the interstate, my truck starts skipping. Wow, I got some bad diesel. The further I went, the worse it skipped. Oh, man, I got to run this about a half a tank out and fill it back up again. I'm, I'm still, you know, I got bad diesel. About 20 miles later, kaboom, kaboom, boom. I blew two pumps. I called Bonnie on the phone. Bonnie, come get me. I, my truck stopped running. I got bad diesel. Daddy, you didn't put gas in there, did you? No. Green handle, green pump. Where'd you stop? I said, a BP station. She says, Daddy, all the BP stations have green handles. <laughs> Impatience. $1,000 later. Sometimes it's just money. But I've seen impatient people lose a marriage, a fortune, 
an advancement in their job, a car crash. Patience always cost, and it began the demise of Saul. Saul lost his kingdom for a few hours of impatience. Think about that, and don't be like Saul. The second thing I saw about him that that he had a problem with, he says here in, in, in in the section that I read to you, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and, and he's blaming all of this other stuff. It's everyone's fault, it's everything's fault but him. See, impatient people have a tendency to be blamers and finger pointers. I do stupid stuff and I blame something else. We were talking about my diesel incident last night and she says, do you think that when you, when you put the gas in your diesel, do you think that was impatience? And I said, well, yeah, but you know I was taking medication. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, excuses, and we do. We bl- we, if you're impatient and you do something dumb, what's the first? And, and th- this, the problem with that is that you never deal with your own heart. As long as I'm blaming it on medication, I'm never going to deal with my impatience. Am I right? If I can find something or someone to blame it on, I never repent and I never change. I just get worse and worse and worse and I end up like Saul losing everything. Patient people are impatient. They can become blamers. And then the third thing that I saw here is he says, bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And patient people become independent. And independence is not bad except if you become independent of the ways of God, the way that God works, the things that God wants to do. You don't need God. And impatient people tend to go there. See, by Saul saying, I'll do the offering, by Saul saying that, he's, what he's saying is, I don't need Samuel. I, I, I don't need people in my life. I don't need to go to church. I can pray for myself. And besides, hey, it's raining, and I didn't have a good week, and I'm tired. And what we've done is just done something foolish. What we've done, what we've done is said, say, God, I don't need you. See, God has a way that he wants to bless us, and if we will stay in that way, He will bless us. But what we do is we get independent from God and we get independent. We say, well, I I, want to watch the Braves and we know God wants us to read our Bible or pray. What does God say about tithing? Should, Should we tithe? I'm not asking you if you tithe, but should we tithe? Do you believe God wants you to tithe? But we blatantly don't do it. We... We change his ways. We don't need to tie. And we head down the road of Saul. And we become independent of church. And we become independent of what God wants to do in our lives. And we turn, just like Saul did, from God. I watch people with this independent spirit all the time. I watch them get independent from what God says to do. They stop praying, they stop giving, they stop attending, and then I watch them lose everything. I watch them being tormented by evil spirits. And blame it on the devil. It's not the devil's fault, it's our fault. Because we did not obey the word of the Lord. Watch them lose their marriages. Watch them lose their money. I watch them lose their health. Saul said, you acted foolishly. Impatient, blaming, and independent from God's way people are fools. Whether we want to admit it or not, we acted foolishly. 
I was just in a hurry, but you acted foolishly. Well, you know they made me mad, and I just didn't feel like praising God. Yeah, but you acted foolishly. I wanted to go out to eat. I know God says to tithe, but I wanted to go out to eat. Yeah, but you acted foolishly. I know I'm supposed to go to church, but I'm tired. I want to sleep in. Yeah, but you acted foolishly. And you become independent of God's ways. Don't be like Saul. The Lord uh, instructed Saul to do one of the most severe things in the Bible. I'm going to read it to you in 1 Samuel 15, 3. It says, Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put them to death, men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. What have the Amalekites done? <laughs> you, you remember the story where uh, the nation of Israel had just come out of Egypt and, and Joshua was in the valley fighting and having a battle and her and Aaron had to hold his arms up. Remember that? And, uh, that was the Amalekites. And I, I found this neat scripture. I want, to, I want you to see it because it's just so cool. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 16, it says, He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. That, that is so good to me. See, when we lift up our hands, when I ask you to lift up your hands, I'm not just asking you to do some religious thing. I want you to lift your hands up to the throne of the Lord because as long as you're lifting your hands up to the throne of the Lord, the Amalekites in your life are being defeated. Every generation fights Amalekites. That's what the verse says, isn't it? Lift up your hands to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Every generation battles Amalekites. Now, in the natural today, that's the terrorist. They're the sneaky ones. They, the Amalekites would sneak up and get the weak and the weary, and they would sneak around and ambush. That's what, that's what the terrorists do. And so in the natural, we're battling the Amalekites. But in our own lives, we battle the Amalekites. It's things that sneak up on our lives from the inside, things that come and get us from the inside and bring us down. And every generation battles the Amalekites. Lift up your hands. <laughs> uh, he said, I want them utterly destroyed. In our lives, he, God wants some things utterly destroyed. And we don't do it, so that our next generation has to battle them. Our children have to battle the things that we didn't whip. Impatience and blaming others and independence from God's way moves us now into blatant disobedience. Blatant disobedience. Um, say it. God says, I want you to, to, to kill what? How about what? You tell me. What, what did he say I want you to do? Everything. Cats, dogs, everything. Now watch what he does. Blatantly. 1 Samuel 9, 15, 9 says, But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything that was good. These, they were unwilling. Would you say unwilling? unwilling. See, it's not that we're unable. It's that we're... Come on, admit it. I'm trying to help you. It's not that we're unable to do it. It's that we're unwilling to do it. Sometimes it's not that we're un unable to give like we're supposed to do. We're unwilling. It's not that we're unable to get out of bed and get to church on Sunday. It's that we're unwilling. It's not, it's not that we're unable to read our Bible. It's that we're unwilling. It's not that we're unable to pray. It's that we're unwilling to pray. Come on, somebody. Help me just a little bit. I know it's tough, but it's true, right? Come on. And that takes us down the road of Saul. Unwilling to destroy completely, and everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. <laughs> Saul told Samuel that he was keeping this stuff to sacrifice it to the Lord. Uh, let me read it to you in 1 Samuel 15, 22. It says, but Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Blatant disobedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. Can I tell you that if you obey, you will sacrifice? 
If, if you obey the Lord, you're going to give him the sacrifice, correct? That's why obedience is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed better than the fat of rams. Now, look, we got, I want to make sure you get the picture. It started with impatience and moved to blaming and finger pointing, and then it moves to doing away with the ways of God. Now it's moved to blatant disobedience. Now it's moving into rebellion. He says, for rebellion is like the sin of divination, and King James Bible says witchcraft. And then it moves from there into arrogance. And arrogance, Saul had become arrogant, rebellious, disobedient, just like some of us. Like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. Listen to me, please. The way you treat the word of the Lord is the way the Lord treats you. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what? You obey my commandments. The way we treat the word of the Lord is the way we get treated. The, the word of the Lord determines our destinies and, and determines our lives. It's able to save our own souls. God wanted obedience from Saul. God wants obedience from us. He doesn't, he, he'll get the sacrifice if he gets the obedience. He wants us to stay away from rebellion and he wants to stay. Do you, do you get the process now? how he started so well, but then he got impatient, and then he started blaming, and, and, then, and then he moved there. I don't need the things of God and the people of God. And, the way, and, and, then, and then he moved into blatant disobedience, and then, and then he moves into rebellion, and, and then, then it's arrogant. And, you, and so all Samuel was trying to do was try to help him. Am I right? All Samuel was trying to do was help Saul. But Saul's arrogant. Just like when I try to say some things here sometimes, some of you say, well, what can that preacher tell me anyway? I'm just trying to help you. And you get arrogant with me. Verse uh, 15, chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, verse 35 says, until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord was grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, that doesn't sound like such a big deal. Whoopie-doo, Samuel just didn't come to see Saul. But let me tell you what that really means. What that really means is that Saul never heard the voice of the Lord again for the rest of his life. See, in the Old Covenant, the way the word of the Lord came was through the prophet. And if you wanted the word of the Lord, if you wanted to hear the Lord speak, if you wanted to get in the presence of the Lord, you had to go to the prophet. And Samuel never spoke to Saul again. Saul never heard the voice of God again. He never felt the presence of God again. How awful! You got... He stopped hearing the voice of the Lord. He stopped being blessed. The blessings that he had were going to be taken away from him. And an evil spirit had come to torment him. Don't be like Saul. Now, I got to close. I, I tried to condense a whole, this, there was chapter 10, 1 Samuel to chapter 31. And I'm trying to show you about Saul here in, in 30 minutes. And I'm not going to do it, but I was trying. And I got to close. I want to rehearse quickly with you in our next few minutes about the life of Saul and how it ended. The Bible says that he was tormented by an evil spirit from the Lord. And it was true. It was from an evil spirit from the Lord. Delbert, how can you say that? Because I know what tormented Saul. And I know God sent it. You know. If you read your Bible, you know. What was Saul tormented with the rest of his life? David. The thought of David taking over the kingdom tormented Saul. I'm not saying David was evil. I'm saying that the hatred that Saul had for David was evil. 
which allowed an evilness to come into his life. And Saul spent the rest of his life chasing David around. He hated, he hated David so badly that he gave his daughter, he gave his daughter to David to be married. With a, it, was, it was just a, a hook, it was, it was a trap, it was a snare so that David would be killed by the Philistines. Now, I can't get into all the details of it, but he wanted 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And he said, David, you give me 100 foreskins of the Philistines, you can marry my daughter. And the whole plan was so that David would go out and get killed. He threw a javelin at his own son, his own successor. He threw a javelin trying to kill his own son because his son was a friend of David. He... He killed 85 priests, 85 innocent priests, simply because they gave food to David and to David's men. 85. He was evil and wicked, and the thing about David just, just consumed him. Hatred. And you, and you know people that are consumed with hatred today. It's an evil spirit. He was so consumed by David that he was oblivious to the Philistines building this huge army that would kill him and kill his children. Because he was so out there chasing David around in the wilderness. Consumed, tormented, tortured. So he saw the army of the Philistines. And so what he did, he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord wouldn't answer him. Some of us sometimes we wonder, why can't we hear from God? We've done everything. Saul did everything he knew to do. But he could not hear a word from God. What he had done was not do what he was supposed to do. He was impatient. He was a blamer. He, he was independent from the things of God. He blatantly disobeyed the word of the Lord. He was rebellious. And, and he was these things, you see. And, and he, God, God, God turned. I mean, he just, God wasn't talking to him. <laughs> and we wonder sometimes why he doesn't talk to us. He saw the armies out there and so what he ended up doing was going to a witch's house because he couldn't get God to speak to him. So he was going to go to a witch's house and conjure up Samuel from the dead and get Samuel to give him a word. And here's what it says in 1 Samuel 28, 19, 18 and 19. It says, because Samuel up from the grave, to the witch's surprise, Samuel does come up. And he says, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord... Not the devil. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines and tomorrow. You and your sons will be dead like me. The Philistines attacked. They killed Saul's three sons. They critically wounded Saul. And here's what the final verse about Saul says in 1 Samuel 31, 4. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, for these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it, committed suicide. He began so well, but he ended so poorly. He should have had it all. He had nothing. You and I should have it all. Why don't we? It's a little too much Saul in all of us. A little too much impatience. A little too much blaming. A little too much independence from the things of God. A little too much blatant disobedience. There's a, 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 little, a little too much rebellion and a little too much witchcraft and just a little too much arrogance. We began so well, but our lives end up so poorly. The constant theme through Saul's life was that he did not obey the word of the Lord. He allowed impatience to take him down a road. Now listen, now don't get arrogant with me, but some of you, some of us, let me say it that way, are blatantly disobedient to the Lord right now. And don't get arrogant with me now and, and get mad at me. I am trying to help you. You wonder why you can't hear from God. You wonder why you, got, got, you get blessings in life and it seems like something happens and they get taken away from you. 
You, you wonder why things go bad in your life? You wonder if I, why, the, why the Philistines are always whooping up on you? You, you, you wonder why things go bad in your life, your marriage goes bad, your children, your children go bad. You, you, you wonder why all these things happen to you. I'm trying to tell you, you've not obeyed the word of the Lord. Saul never did anything about it, though he was told over and over and over again by Samuel, you're not obeying, you're not obeying, you're not obeying, you're not obeying. He never did anything to fix it. Hear me. Will you stand with me? Oh, Jesus. Well, we don't want to be like Saul. Lord, I don't want to go down that road. I want to end well. I don't want to come to the end of my days and have grieved you. And you'd be sad that you ever let me do what I do and be who I am. Lord, I pray for every person here that you've spoken to us today and that we're going to do something to repent. Heads bowed, eyes closed. The Lord spoke to you today, I hope. And you're going to say to the Lord, not to me, but to the Lord, I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to do all I can because I'm interested in not only my life but my children's lives and my future generation's lives. If that's you, would you raise your hand up and just say, Lord, I am going to do better. See hands, hands everywhere. I'm telling you. This is serious. <laughs> serious situation. Okay, you put them down. 